Hi folks, uh, this is Jason. Hope you are okay. It's good to be with you and hope everybody's okay out there. Uh, we're going to be doing a Bible study tonight and uh, I hope everybody uh, is okay. Add into the Word of God. Um, And uh, yeah, hope that you enjoy it. We're looking at grace. I've sent a few invitations out. And uh, and uh, I trust it will be um, a good. Uh, A good uh, Bible study, um, <clears throat> yeah. I'm just going to wait. Uh, or uh, just feel free to to get ready. So this is a, a Bible study for anybody who uh, wants to learn about uh, Christianity and the gospel. So um, that's who it's open for. Really. So uh, it's not for those who just want to come in and debate and like that. So, so just uh, wait for people to come in. This is What a Friend We Have in Jesus by Mark Murchison. I found it in the Lord and Prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear One friend needs to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, 
Folks, this is Jason, and hope everybody's okay. We're doing a Bible study tonight. Uh, those who want to learn what the Bible has to teach about grace are welcome to come. Those who just want to argue and cause trouble, um, you're better off staying away. Those who want to just study the Word of God and learn about the Bible, then you may join if you honestly want to learn about Christ. That makes me white as snow, no other grounds I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I say, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the cloak that makes me white as snow. No other bound I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the cloak. That makes me white as snow, no other fact I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen.
these songs are Mark Murchison. Leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. How sweet to walk in the pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. to fear leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arm. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, we come before you today. And Father, we confess all our sin. And Father, we acknowledge our guilt. And we acknowledge our weakness. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, how foolish we are. And you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And we come before you, Lord. And we confess all our sin today. We acknowledge that you are our God, that you are a great God. And I just bow before you, O oh God, and worship thee and give thee the glory, give thee the honor. I acknowledge that you are our God today. And I pray, Father, in your name, Lord, that this Bible study would be a blessing to people, that, Father, you would breathe upon it, your power, that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would fall upon the words, that, Lord, the right people would hear this message, and if people come, the right people would come. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. And, Father, we ask for your glory to be in this Bible study 
We ask, Lord, that you would bless. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage us. And, Father, that you would refresh us and renew us through your word. And so, Father, I pray that you bless this study tonight. And that, Lord, we will grow closer to you. We acknowledge our weakness and our failure. We acknowledge our need of your grace, our need of your love. And so, Father, we commit everything to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be with you tonight, and I hope everybody's okay. We're looking at the Word of God. Uh, if anybody comes on the Google Hangout tonight, it's a Bible study, and you must come with respect, or you will not be allowed on to the channel, okay? And we're not here tonight to debate. We're here to teach the Word of God and to any sincere heart that wants to learn about the Bible is welcome to join us. In the passage that we're looking at tonight is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 10. And you hath quickened us who were dead in trespasses and sins, when in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, in riches of his grace, in his king kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had beforehand that he should walk in them. That God has before ordained that he should walk in them. And that verse, verse chapter 2, verse 8 in the book of Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Christianity is different from all other religions, from Islam and Buddhism and Mormonism and, and whatever ism you want to put on it, Christianity is different. And it's different because salvation is a gift. All the other religions, it's how you earn salvation. But Christianity is about what God has done for you, provided that salvation, and it's called grace. The grace of God in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave his son. He gave all that he had. Lavished his son upon the world. How willing was Jesus to die that we rebel sinners might live. The life they could not take away. How ready was Jesus to give. They pierced through his hands and his feet. His body he freely resigned. The pains of his flesh were so great, but greater the pangs of his mind. I heard an atheist the other day who said, well, God planned the salvation and he committed the salvation and he sacrificed to himself. No. We forget that Christ was God in the flesh. He was a human being. 
And as a human being, he made a choice to be faithful unto death. And how God suffered at that cross as he took the wrath that we deserved. But it was in choice that men chose to sin in a real world. <coughs> and there are skeptics today that will point to you <coughs> and show you the sufferings of the world. They will show you all the sufferings that they can find to try and silence you and say that there is no God. <coughs> because if there is a God, why would God allow such a thing? But it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God dealt with suffering at the cross. God gave all he could at that cross to save humanity. What is interesting is when these skeptics are angry against God, why are they not angry against Father Christmas? Secondly, when they point out issues of suffering in the world and they say that God is immoral for allowing suffering in the world, where on earth do they get objective morality from if they believe in evolution? The skeptic has to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to judge God. That is how silly their position is. But we are not here to do that. We are not here to pull apart skepticism, <coughs> which is easy to do. We are here to talk about the glories of God in the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to be born again. And he proved it by giving himself to die upon a cross for us all. For by grace are you saved. Number one, are you spiritually dead? Are you spiritually dead? Excuse me. Imagine you have died and you are on a hospital bed. You lay on that bed. It is a summer's day and there is a window near the bed. And the curtains are open and outside it's shining with sun. There are children playing in a garden and the birds are singing. But because you are dead, you cannot hear the birds, you cannot see the sun, and you do not hear the children. Because you are dead. My friend, did you know that you are spiritually dead? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. <coughs> As for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. Transgressions and sins. You may say that you do not believe in God because of X, Y, Z. You do not believe in God for one reason and one reason only. You are spiritually dead. Whenever you hear the word of God preached, you cannot hear it in your heart and the power of the word because you are spiritually dead. It says flesh gives birth to flesh and the spirit gives birth to spirit. Until you have a spiritual mind, you will not understand spiritual things. Abba Ban said, so with the sinner in regard to spiritual and eternal 
So with the sinner in regard to the spiritual and eternal world, he sees no beauty in religion, he hears not the call of God, he is of the Savior, and he has no interest in eternal realities. Isaiah 9 verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death a light as dawn. Men and women and boys and girls are walking in the ways of darkness and do not know the light that has come to the world because their eyes have not been opened. James chapter 115, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full again gives birth to death. Men and women and boys and girls are born and they live in sin. They are enticed by their own desires. Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off to throw it away. It is better for you to, to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 30. We are sinners. We walk in sin. We commit adultery in our heart. And we don't take sin seriously. We play around with sin and we don't think it's sin. We don't realize that there is a holy God and every time we sin, we sin against the holy God. I would just check that reference if we just go to Matthew 5. Let's go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 27. Yep, my reference is correct. I'll just check it. There was an American football coach who had some American footballers in the changing rooms. And he threw into the room and all the men ran out of the room as fast as they could and he said to them just as you've run away from that snake run away from drugs and drink and loose women we are dead in sin and we walk in sin and we we feed on sin and God tells us that he is a holy God, he hates sin and that we're to flee sin just like we would flee a rattlesnake. Why? Romans 6 verse 23, for the wrath of, for the, sorry, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift life in Christ Jesus our God it's a gift but the wages of sin is death is death if we sin we get death we get death now and then we get eternal death but the gift of God is eternal life God wants to give you eternal life and if you reject him And you are heading for hell. You were made for better things. You were made for to be a better person. You were made for eternity. Th this life was not all it was meant to be. You were made for eternity. You were made to be with your God 
and you're throwing away your inheritance you're throwing away your eternal destiny by running into hell because you think you're clever because you think you're smart because you don't think you need God you do need God he made you you were made to worship him you were made to follow him and you'll be lost forever if you reject him 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 3 and 5 but you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do living in debauchery lust drunkenness orgies carousing and detestable idolatry they think it's strange that you do not plunge that with them into some foul flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead debauchery carousing all the sins of the flesh that you are doing is because you are dead in sin and you have not been awakened to know the living God so cry out to him that he will give you the desire to seek after holiness and to seek after the living God and put away your debauchery put away your adultery put away your fornication put away your carousing put away your drunkenness put away your lust put it away and flee from it and move in the direction of God number two are you controlled by Satan there are demonic forces there is a evil and in your cleverness and in your life as you go around doing your shopping and doing whatever you're doing there is a devil and he is blinding you and he is putting before you desires of ambition desires for wealth desires of the flesh and he is giving you what you want and you're following that and God and Satan has blinded you it says the God of this world has blinded them and you've fallen into the into the ways of what Satan wants you to do and you think you're clever you think you don't need God but all the time you're being blinded by the Satan Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient did you know that Ouija boards are on the increase for for being sold that that they're being sold like hotcakes in the UK satanic activity is on the increase you are being influenced by Satan and I can prove it to you you get a hold of your Bible you start to read your Bible and start to follow it and you will know the attack of Satan upon you 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work on John chapter 3 verse 8 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God men and women don't reject the God men and women don't reject the Bible because they know things and they are clever they reject it because they are blind by Satan they are blinded by Satan turn to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 18 Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 18 
6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 11 to 18. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having gone the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with in the Spirit, and watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You're going to defeat the devil. You need the whole armor of God. And if you're an unbeliever today, how can you stand against demonic forces if you do not know the armor of God? You don't know the gospel. You don't know biblical truth. You don't know the ways of the Lord. You're not armed. Above all, taking the shield of faith we're in, you shall, yet, shall be able to what? Quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the what? Helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You don't have these things. You're leaving your family wide open to attack. You're leaving your own mind to attack from Satan who will blind you because you are turning away from the truth. You might read the skeptic books. You might go to you might read the culture you might read about islam and your mind might be taken captive by middle eastern religions but i'm telling you you are being hoodwinked by satan because you do not know the the ways of the lord you don't know about the gospel you don't know about his spirit you don't know about his word and so you don't know about the truth you don't know about the breastplate of righteousness and you're leaving yourself wide open to be blinded by Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Someone asks you to go to church, but you don't go to the church, you go to the nightclub and you sleep around. The devil is tempting you. The devil is tempting you. You're reading your Bible and some skeptic gives you a load of attacks on the Bible. The devil is tempting you. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then he says, whom resist as steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that, in the that are in the world. Be steadfast in faith. In the gospel. In the gospel. In the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that gospel, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. He, cried, he died on that cross and he gave his life for you on that cross. He took your punishment for you on that cross, which we'll look at more in a minute, but he gave himself on that cross and you can stand fast in the gospel and you can resist the attempts of Satan to pull you down. If you ever have suicidal thoughts, it's Satan attacking you. If you ever feel you're nobody and you're nothing, it's Satan pulling you down at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, you, even though you're in sin, you're still a child of the living God. And you need to come home to your father. 
you need to come out of darkness you need to come out of the darkness that you're in come out of witchcraft come out of atheism come out of paganism come out of buddhism hinduism islam come out of the gay rights movement come out of it all leave it all and come into the light of christ come into him come to the lord come to the gospel come to the cross where he gave himself for you where he died for you on that cross he was crucified for you he broke himself for you he gave his body for you he gave it says God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us in Romans 5 God demonstrated his love towards you that he died for you now come out of the darkness come out of spiritual deadness and come alive Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life no one can come to the Father but through me he the light he says if you're thirsty come to him come to Christ and look to him and trust in him he says I am the resurrection and the life he said to Lazarus come forth Lazarus was dead in the tomb and he came out and came alive and if you believe in Christ you'll have spiritual life Jesus Christ fed 5,000 with a few fishes and a few loaves. He brought hope where there was no hope. He brought hope to the cripples. He brought hope to those who were lepers, those who were in, who, who had no hope. He came and he gave them hope when Peter was walking on the water in the sea. He sank and, and, and he had to hold on to Christ by faith and he was able to walk on water. And Jesus says, it is I, be not afraid. You need to come out of darkness and you need to come and look to the light of Christ and look to the living Savior and trust in him. For he is alive. The God had bodily dwell with him. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in verse 14 in John chapter 1 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father the glory of God dwelt in him he made himself of no reputation it says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God in Philippians but he made himself of no reputation and became obedient even to the death of the cross and so therefore God highly exalted him at the right hand of the Father. You need to come out of death and into light, into Christ and trust in him and believe in him. Come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says the Lord. Or in your intellectualism, in your, in your atheism, is nothing compared to the light of Christ, to the joy of the Lord, who says that he wants you to bear fruit in him, who says that he is the vine and you are the branches and you need to lean on him in faith so that you become a branch and bear fruit for your Lord if you believe in him. Your skepticism is not logically thought out. You have not thought it out. If you thought it out, you wouldn't be a skeptic. There is no meaning to life if you're a skeptic. There is no ultimate meaning to anything that you're doing on a cosmic scale. Only what you put to your own private opinion, which is therefore a logical inconsistency. When you say you want evidence for belief in things, you cannot provide an evidence for the ultimate belief of the meaning of life. And you can't do that. And yet you live. You're logically inconsistent inconsistent as a skeptic and those who are Muslims today who say the Bible has changed if you read the Quran it's got a lot to say about reading the Bible it has not got the corruption attack on the Bible that you say it has as Muslims did you know as Muslims that the scholarship on the Bible from Islam over the first 600 years the Islamic scholars did not attack the Bible it came in the 12th century, this idea that the Bible had changed. And then you have a problem with Bukhari Hadith, where it talks about Huthman burning the Quran. <coughs> and you have a problem to explain that. And it's no good saying that that is not a good Hadith. It is there, and it is a Hadith. And it needs to be explained. And 
what that tells you is it says learned by Uthman that Qurans were that one recension of a Quran was made and other Qurans were burnt and one recension was made in the Bukhari Hadith and you keep it under the carpet and you do not tell people that your Quran was changed and yet you have the temerity to say the Bible has changed and yet when you study your own Quran it doesn't say the Bible has been changed and if you study your own scholars for the first 600 years it didn't say the Bible had changed Satan is on the prowl, he is a roaring lion and he has blinded you and the only way that you can see is that you begin to look to the Logos, to the Word of God in Christ for he is the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was John chapter 1 verse 14 and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us until you look to the Word of God in Christ it was God incarnate, God the living word, all that God was, he was. As you look at him, you will be set free. You will have open eyes to see the glory of the Lord. And you'll come out of darkness into the living light. You'll never find the meaning of life in skepticism, in atheism, in agnosticism. You'll never find the meaning of life in Islam. You'll never find the meaning of life in postmodernism, where it says that, you can believe anything you want, a mix pie, a mix ideas, mix it all up. You'll never find the meaning of life in these things. Only in Christ, only in the Lord, only in Jesus will you find the meaning of life. For he is the living God, he is the beginning of the end. He came down and he died on that cross and he arose from the dead and he conquered the grave and he's alive today. Answering prayers, answering prayers, answering prayers. Thirdly, are you under the wrath of God? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3. All of us do live among them at any time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following his desires. Sorry, we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. I can't read my handwriting. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. among whom also we had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even among whom also we had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others every time you sin every time you commit adultery every time you get drunk every time you are proud every time you are unloving every time you walk your way and do not bow the knee to christ you are storing up the wrath to come god is a god who is alive and he is powerful and he is great and he is holy and he created the world and he's a living god and if you reject him and walk in your way you will be under the wrath of God. You will be sent to hell for eternity, where you will burn in hell on fire. I don't know if it's going to be in your heart that you believe and see that you have rejected God. I don't know how hell is going to turn out, but I know ultimately you're going to be in agony because you've rejected the living God. And it don't stop for five minutes. It goes on forever and ever because you rejected the living awesome God he is a great mighty God he is a powerful God he is greater than you ever dreamed he holds the galaxies in his fingertips and there are billions of galaxies with billions of stars and he holds them in his hand and he is great and awesome and powerful and you are rejecting him and as you reject him you come under his wrath reason why you don't believe that because you don't realize how big he is. 
And you can sit there and you mock and say all that you want to say. But you don't want to come against the fierce wrath and anger of God. Because when his wrath comes, it will burn you to a cinder, boy. It'll burn you to a cinder, girl. You'll be in agony. Weeping and wailing. Weeping and wailing. Weeping and wailing. Weeping and wailing. It'll be so bad for you, my friend. You will cry and cry and cry forever and ever and ever. And the agony will never stop. Because he is a holy God. Because he's a holy God. Francis Schaeffer said, there is, a real, there is no real preaching of the Christian gospel except in the light of the fact that man is under the wrath of God. Francis Schaeffer said, there is no real preaching of the Christian gospel except in the light of the fact that man is under the wrath of God. The church doesn't preach the wrath of God anymore. The church doesn't believe in the wrath of God no more. Deuteronomy 28, 28, the Lord will afflict you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. Proverbs 127, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will overtake you. You want to mock God? You want to mock the preachers of God? God says to you, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. You want to mock the ministers of God? You want to mock Christ? You want to mock the living God? You go ahead and mock it, my friend, because the wrath of God is coming to you. And when it comes, you'll be sorry. I, in turn, will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. A nation that mocks God, a nation that rejects the word of God. I, in turn, will laugh at your disaster, and I will mock when calamity overtakes you. Go ahead, America. Go ahead, England. Go ahead, Europe, and reject God and laugh at him and mock him. And God says, I in turn will laugh at your disaster when calamity overtakes you. Don't you dare mess with the living God. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. Surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil burner will be stubble. And that day is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace and all the arrogant and every evil will be stubble. And that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Go ahead and laugh. Go ahead and mock. I'll see you on judgment day. And then you'll not be laughing. Then you'll be cast into the living lake of fire. Then you will burn forever. Then you'll be in agony. And then you'll wish you never sinned. Then you'll wish you never mocked. Get down on your knees. And bow the knee to Christ. And repent of your sin. John MacArthur, the gospel message begins with a statement about the wrath of God. Frankly, that is diametrically opposed to most of our evangelistic techniques. Most of our contemporary evangelism purposely avoids them. And the living church today will not preach the wrath to come. Will not preach the wrath of God. And therefore the church will be judged also. 
Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6. Let no one deceive you. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And that goes for you, sister. And that goes for you, brother. You walk in sin and God is going to bring wrath upon you. We cannot play around with porn. We cannot play around with sexual sin. We cannot play around with immorality. God will bring his judgment even upon his own church. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Romans 5, 9, sinner. Sins, sorry. We have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from what? From God's wrath through him. Do you understand the greatness of salvation? That we have been saved from the wrath of God. Since we have now been justified. The Greek word justified means declared right. Since we have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? The blood of Christ. The savior of the world. Christ who was God in the flesh. His blood sacrificed for you. His blood dealt the took the judgment that you deserved. When Christ was taken into the courtyard. When they spat at him and mocked him and laughed at him. He was dying on that cross for you. He was broken for you. Since we have now been justified by his blood, we are declared right before God because. And as we believe in Christ, we are washed, we are clean. We are clean in the blood of the Messiah. We are clean in the blood of the Savior. For his blood is a holy blood. His blood is a divine blood. His blood is beautiful. His blood is divine. His blood is glorious and great. Only his blood could have saved us from the wrath to come. And it was poured out willingly, lovingly for the whole world. For God so loved the world, do you remember? And as he hung on the cross, and as the blood came down, he was dying for sinners. He was holy and pure and never knew any sin. And the heart of God was broken as the wrath came down. And as you come to that clean, it says you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. It means you can be a prostitute all your life and come to that blood and be clean. And be washed and be new and have a new day, a new dawn. It means you can be full of hate all your life and come to the cross and say, Lord, forgive me. And you come to have a soft, clean heart. It means you can come with your pride, your intellectual pride. And as you come to the cross, it will melt you and humble you and clean you of your pride. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Oh, he was a Prince of Glory as he died on that cross. And can it be that I should gain an interest in his blood? And he gave all that he had for you. Why will you hide from the cross? Why will you hide from the Lord who gave himself for you? Matthew 25, verse 30. And throw that worthless servant outside in darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30. That goes for you religious people too. You might go to church. You might go to church. You might be well Respected in your church. But you don't know God. You're not born again. To throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You made an idol of your own reputation. You made an idol of life. You made an idol of all you did for the Lord. It was not for him and his glory. It was all for you. It's all for you, religious person, religious man, religious woman. Everything you're doing, it's all for you. And it's not for the Lord. It's not from his, your heart because you love him. So also that men will clap their hands and say, what a good person you are. You're going on the way to hell, sister. You're going on the way to hell, brother. Because it's all about you and not about the Lord. Get down on your knees, sister. Get down on your knees, brother. And repent of your religion. And get right with the Lord and be born again of the Spirit of God. And do everything out of a love for Jesus. He wants to be intimate with you just like he was intimate. Just like he was intimate with Nicodemus. Just like he was intimate with Mary and Martha. Just like he was intimate with the lepers. Just like he was intimate with Matthew and Peter and John. He wants to be intimate with you, sister. He wants to be intimate with you, brother. But now you've got to repent of your religion. Because it's an anathema to the Lord. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, 42. You're on the way to hell. So repent. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Is that what you want? While people are saying peace and safety, is that what you want? You want your little ears and say, oh, what a good person you are. Is that what you want? Preachers to do that. Tickle your little ears and say, oh, what a good person you are. Oh, thank you for this and thank you for that. Oh, aren't you a nice person? Is that what you want? Or do you want a preacher to tell you the truth that you need to hear? While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them. And these preachers who tickle your ears and tell you what a nice person you are and won't say anything negative, destruction will come. Because you were not warned. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 And then finally, are you saved by grace? Are you saved by grace? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're angry, are you, sister? Oh, you're angry, are you, brother? You're angry at the preaching, are you? And I'm sorry, sister. I don't dance to your tune. I dance to God's tune. And I dance to the word of God. And the word of God says, repent. And believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And you're not saved, so repent. Get down on your knees and say, Lord, all that I've been doing in church has been religion. It's all been religion. It's all been about my reputation. I never fed the poor. I never took somebody in. I never helped the lonely. I never did anything for those people who were the outcast of my church, the outcast of society. No, no, no. But I did go to church with a suit on. I did put a, a bit of money in the offering. I did do a little bit for the church. And I did become an even office bearer in the church. And uh, I got a reputation now. God says to you, out of my mouth, because you're neither hot nor cold. So get on your knees now. Get on your knees now and repent and put away your anger and stop being angry at me because your pride's been hurt and humble yourself under god who do you think you are you're not god now humble yourself before him and get right with him and ask him to clean you ask him to forgive you Go to church as a born again believer. Born again in the Holy Spirit. Rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Walking in the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit. Flowing in the Holy Spirit. Serving in the Holy Spirit. 
You're a spirit-filled Christian, friend. That's what you need to do when you go to church. Put away the religion. Put away the act. Put away the superficiality. Put away the, the, the desire to please men. And start to please God. Finally, are you saved by grace? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us. But God who is rich in mercy. Ooh, he is rich in mercy. For his great love wherein he loved us. My friend, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us. He is rich in mercy. There are people today who are billionaires. They are magnificently rich. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us. Oh, he's rich. Rich beyond your wildest dreams. Oh, he can clean you and forgive you and wash you. He is rich in mercy. For his great love wherein he loved us. It was a great love. How great was it that he came in human flesh and came and died on a cross for your sin? Now, what greater love could you have than that? It is a great love. It is a great love. That he would come and die in your place for all your sin and my sin. Every sin that you ever committed in your life. Every sin that you ever committed, have committed and will ever commit. He willingly died for you. Do you remember they arrested him? Do you remember they took him into a courtyard? Do you remember they spat on the Savior? Do you remember they put a crown of thorns upon his head? Do you remember they put a robe around him? Do you remember they whipped him and whipped him and laughed at him? The royal Savior, the royal King, the living God in the flesh, standing there with a robe around him and a crown of thorns upon his head. Being mocked and laughed at. And there he stands. Every sin you ever did. Every sin that you will do. He was willingly allowing himself. To suffer on your behalf. For you. Then. When they had done their worst. They got him to carry a cross. And then as he carried the cross. He took the cross and could not carry it no more and he had to be helped. And then they took him to Golgotha where they drove the nails in his hands and they drove the nails in his feet and he was dying for your sin. Every sin that you ever committed, he was dying for you. And he hung on that cross for every sin that you ever have committed, ever will commit, and are committed. And there he died. Because the agony of the wrath of God was coming upon him. It's a mystery. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in these three are one. It is a mystery, but the Son of God was there. Suffering on that cross for you. Taking the wrath of the Father, it is too deep. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, boundless. Boundless. And there he lay upon the cross. And as men and women looked up, and as his mother looked up, and as his disciples who ran away saw the Lord crucified from a distance. 
He was the Son of God dying for your sin and the sin of everyone who believe in Him. The only way mankind can have a hope is to come to Jesus Christ the Savior. To come to the Lord who was crucified for them. To believe in Him and to know Him. That is the only way. That is the only provision. That is the meaning of it all. That He came and He died and He was crucified for you and for me. What a Savior. Be thou my vision, says the hymn. He will valiant be against all disaster. To be a pilgrim, to be a servant, to trust him, the Savior, who gave himself for you. Paul, the apostle, saw himself as a slave to Christ by this Messiah who died and rose again. He was captivated by him. He was enthralled by the cross. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I live in Christ. He, he lived for Christ. Christ was everything to him because he was so amazed at the love of God in Christ. He couldn't get it out of his mind what Christ had done. It was so amazing. Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken. Stricken. By God smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed Isaiah surely has took our infirmities and carried our sorrows yet we considered him stricken by God smitten and afflicted but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed he took the full wrath of God so that you may live. Isaiah 54 verse 7 For a brief moment I abandon you but with deep compassion I will bring you back. You might feel abandoned at this present time because you have walked in the ways of sin and God is not pleased with that. You have for a brief moment, I have deep compassion. I will bring you back with deep compassion. God wants to bring you back. Psalm 103, verse 8 The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Abounding in love. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 103, verse 8. I talked a lot about the wrath of God, but I want to tell you that God is compassionate, that God is gracious, and God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not turn you away. He said, Jay, I've been sleeping around. He doesn't want me. Yes, he does. Oh, he does. He said, Jay, I've got low self-esteem. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Want me? Yes, he does. He said, Jay, I've never achieved anything. I don't seem to get it together. I keep going into prison, out of prison. I, I can't get my act together. He doesn't want me. Yes, he does. He wants you. He said, Jay, I'm on my own. I've got a kid. I'm a single mother. Does God want me? Yes, he wants you. He said, Jay, I'm in retirement. I've been around. I didn't need God. I didn't want God. Does he really want me? Yes, he does. Jay, I'm an atheist. I've mocked you. I've laughed at you. I've took the mick out of you. I've, I've just took the mick and mick and mick and I've just laughed at you and I've been horrible and despicable towards you. Are you telling me that God wants me? Yes, he does. He'll forgive every sin and everything you've ever said and done.
The Lord is compassionate, just slow to anger and abounding in love. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 7. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Titus 3, 4, 7. Read it and meditate on that passage. Get a Bible and meditate on Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 7. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appear, it's come to you. The love of God has come to you. He saved you. Now if you have faith. Not because of righteous things we have done, not because of what we have done, but because of his mercy, because of what Christ has done. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, that's being born again by the Holy Spirit. And the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's all about Christ having faith in him and believing in him. That having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We are justified by his grace. In other words, what Christ did on the cross for you means that that puts you right with God. All your sins that should have been punished, he took your punishment. And if you believe in Christ, you will not be punished for your sin. You'll be forgiven. Turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 verse 11 to 31. And he said a certain man, Luke chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 15, Verse 11 to 31. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 31. If you have a Bible, please get hold of it. Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 31. Or maybe 32. Let's read. And he said, a certain man had... The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father off his father saw him and had compassion ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and the son said unto him father I have sinned against heaven and in my in thy sight and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son but the father said to his servant bring forth the best robe and put it on him put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring here the the cadet fatty calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father had killed the fatted calf, because he had received him safe. 
And he was angry and would not go in, therefore came his father. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither I transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. I was meet, it was meet, that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. This parable is a wonderful parable of the prodigal son. It's about a son who says to his father, I want my inheritance, and the father gives him his inheritance. In Jewish culture of that time, if a son said that to the father, it would have been an insult. It would have been an absolute insult. As the father gives it to him. Then the son wastes the inheritance on riotous living, and he can't survive anymore. And he goes back home. Now, in that time, if he'd have gone back home, the village would have come out and stoned him. And the father would have hit him. But when he came out, the father greets him with open arms and puts a ring on his finger and says, My son was lost and now is found. Killed the fatted calf and was merry when he came back. And this is a picture of God and human beings. God is the father and we are the prodigal son. We say to God, give us our inheritance. We live in this life and do our own thing. Then we realize we've sinned. And we come back to the Father. And he doesn't reject us. He puts us on the robes of Christ. As we trust in Christ, we are put We put the robes of Christ's blood and righteousness on. That is to say, we become the sons and daughters of God through Christ and the forgiveness of sins in the cross. And we have peace with God. And we have a dwelling with God through Christ. And that is what the prodigal son is all about. My friend, God will never turn you away. He will never ever push you away. However, if you are carried and burdened with sin today, he will never ever push you away. He will draw you to himself. And he will forgive you if you ask for forgiveness. You've got to bow the knee and say, Lord, please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please have mercy. And he will forgive you. For it is by grace, Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through this not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one... Not by works. This is by Christ on the cross. This is the grace, the undeserved mercy of God. God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomprehensible riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has given you the riches of his grace. Believe in him and he will forgive you and he will cleanse you. Matthew eleven twenty-eight thirty. 28, 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the Lord says, come to me, and I will forgive you. I will take your burden. I will claim and have believe in him. Have faith and trust in him. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Nicky Cruz was a leading gang member in New York. Nicky Cruz was a leading gang member in New York. And he was with uh, a lot of gang members, and he was terrorizing a lot of people. And this got into the news, and it was written in a magazine about these gangs in New York. 
and a preacher America called David Wilkinson felt burdened as he read about these gangs in New York and he prayed and he prayed and he was in agony and prayer in the church about whether to go to New York to reach these gangs. He was a pastor of a small church. His wife was pregnant and that day when he was burdened he came home and went to bed and his wife said go. So David Wilkinson went to New York. When he went into the police station the police officer said that if you're going to reach the gangs of New York, we're not coming with you. David Wilkinson then went and hired a hall. And all came in. And he preached a simple message of the cross of Jesus Christ, that Christ loved sinners and died for them. And as he preached that message, gangs different gangs of New York came walking down and each of them gave their lives to Christ Nicky Cruz walked down and he couldn't give his life to Christ because as he was trying to pray and give his heart to Christ deep down he felt that nobody loved him and not even God and he could remember when he was a boy a little boy and his mother would beat him and 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 turned to him one day and says, I don't love you. Around about nine years of age, Nicky Cruz got a rope and tied it to a tree and tried to hang himself. And his other brother saw it and stopped him. So when Nicky Cruz is in the meeting where David Wilkinson, the pastor, had been preaching, and when Nicky Cruz came to the front and he tried to give his heart to the Lord. All he could remember was that nobody loved him. And then in the depths of his heart he said, Jesus, if you really love me, show yourself. And it was at that point Jesus came into his life and he became born again. And he became a new creature in Christ. And he went on to be a preacher of the gospel. He went on to be a minister of the Lord. And even today he is preaching the gospel. Even today he is proclaiming the word of God. Even to this day. God saved him and made him a new man. My friend, God wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants you to be saved today. I don't care if you've been dealing in drugs. I don't care if you're a leader of a gang-lang mafia. I don't care who you are today. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. And Jesus wants you. So why won't you come right now? Come home to Jesus. I need to Jesus right now. Come and give your life to Jesus right now. Right now, be born again. Will you do that? I'm going to play a song. And I'm going to say a prayer at the end of this song. And that can be your time of giving your life to Jesus. The prayer does not save you. But if you say this prayer in your heart, you will be born again. God will come and minister to you right now. And I love that cross Where the dearest and best For worlds to Jesus, the lost sinner Give your heart to the Lord. was slain Get down on your knees and repent 
So I'll cheer you Come down to Jesus now. Pray this prayer. Till my trophy. Dear Lord, at last I have sinned against you. Dear Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I will come. Dear Lord, please come into my life. To the I give it to you. I am saved by grace because of the cross. And because you died on that cross. You took the sin that I did punishment for my sin. And I believe in you, Lord. And I give you my life and I trust you as my Savior. So despite give you my life. By the world. Please come into my life by as the power of the Holy Spirit. And may my life be yours. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For the dear Lamb of God. Right now you are born again in the name of Jesus. The prayer does not save you, but Jesus saves you. Trust in Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Others come forward now. Come. And exchange it You're fighting against it. Come. Don't resist. In the old rugged cross. Down on your knees. Stained with blood. Said Lord. So divine. I'm yours. I stop fighting you. Beauty and I bow the knee. I see. For it was on faith in him. that old cross. Believe the cross. Jesus suffered. You'll be washed. And right now, as you do that, you are washed. And you are forgiven. You are saved. So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling Don't delay now. to the old rugged Some feel they're not loved and will never be loved and exchange love it someday for so much. a crown. You yield to him now. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday. Amen. To my home Amen. far away. Amen. Where his glory forever I say. Those who are Christians, so come and rededicate yourself. Get down on your knees and rededicate your life to Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't give my all. At last I, I hold lay down. I lay it all to you. I will cling to the old road across. Wipe away those tears. And Be saved, change my friend. Save. A child of the living God. So I'll cherish. The old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And
and exchange it some oh, crown. I'll exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Amen. If you've given your heart to the Lord, a few things that you can be doing. Find a local church where they teach the Bible and preach the gospel. If you don't know a church in your area, an evangelical church, let me know and I'll point you to one in your area. Number two, read your Bible each day. It's the word of God. Start with the Gospel of John. Read a chapter a day. And then read some of Paul's epistles. And just read a chapter of a day and the Lord will bless you. Go to Sermon Index. And there you'll find on YouTube a whole vast array of messages that will help you. And also Grace to You and Desiring God Ministries, Grace to You by John MacArthur and Desiring God Ministries. And these will help you in the study of the Word of God. As you read the Word of God, spend time in prayer. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you as you read the Word of God. Start witnessing and telling people about Jesus. Attend church, do good deeds, hear the preaching of the word, attend communion, fellowship with the Lord's people. Live a holy life, turn away from sin. These are some things that you can be doing. These things don't save you, but they are things that will help you to grow as a Christian. If you have intellectual problems about answering questions, turn to Ravi Zacharias' website or to Calm and contact Matt Slick of Calm and he will help you. Uh, calm apology. Just email me and he will help you. So my friend, I'm going to pray over you now that God will be with you, that God will keep you as you are a Christian. And I would encourage you to just keep following him no matter what. It's not going to be easy at times. Keep following him and he will bless you. Let's come before the Lord. Dear Lord, I pray for all these people who give their lives to you through this video. Father, I pray as they have given their lives right now, I pray that they would continue to go on with you. The Father, they would be strong in you, that they would grow in their discipleship of you and that they would become servants for you, Lord. Protect them and help them in any struggles and difficulties that they faced. I pray and minister to them and meet their needs, Lord. And I pray that you would keep them safe and watch over them and bring them home to glory. Bless them, Lord. I ask these things, Lord, in your name and for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay, my friends. That's uh, the end of the message. It was a Bible study, but it actually was a sermon. <laughs> so you've had a sermon. And I uh, hope that you've been blessed. hope it's encouraged you. And uh, God bless you. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. And I uh, hope you enjoyed and found it a blessing tonight. 
This is Jason Burns. Retiring for the evening. Have a lovely evening. God bless you. Let me know if you got saved. Let me know if you got born again. And God bless you. Take care now.